welcome you all here and invite you to join us in singing.
And the hearts of God's people say amen and amen. Welcome to this time of worship with Bethel Grace Baptist Church. We have come together to fix our eyes on the Lord and to behold our God and think about the marvelous grace that he has poured out in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We're gathered in Jesus' name and we are glad that you have joined us. Soon as We have a couple of ministry highlights that I want to share with you. We're going to sing some more praise to the Lord. We're going to dig into the book of Job this morning, especially in the ninth chapter. We are looking forward to continuing on communing with the Lord. I have a couple of quick ministry highlights that I'd like to share with you before I pray and we continue to sing. First, in two weeks, we are having our quarterly business meeting And Sarah, if you can advance that slide, I forgot to bring my clicker. Um, We are having our quarterly business meeting in two weeks. At that time, we will have ministry reports and updates. We will have a financial report. And also, we are going to have a congregational vote to come in support of a missionary family, the Prestwitches. RJ and Sabrina are serving with Cadence International at Joint Base Lewis-McCord in the Tacoma, Washington area. They are serving the Lord by spreading the gospel and doing discipleship with the military personnel of that massive base. And tomorrow morning, I'm gonna be doing an interview on Zoom with RJ and uh, Sabrina just to let the church get to know them a little bit better. So look for the release of that video on YouTube and on Facebook. And we are just looking forward to a partnership with them. Speaking of videos, uh, the leaders of our home fellowship groups are small groups that um, have openings and are available for more participants to join in. Well, we did a little bit of a video too. It's right now, it is on YouTube. And the Christian life is to be lived in community. And so these home fellowship groups provide an opportunity for people together to come together in intimate gatherings, to pray for one another, to share struggles and confess sins with one another, to dig into the word with one another, to have discipleship, and to love one another in the midst of all the things that we face in this world. And so... um, You'll get to hear about the opportunities that are there if you just check out that video. And in addition to that, we're thankful for a men's fellowship group that's taking place on Tuesdays. I'm encouraged that the Women's Missionary Fellowship, they're gonna start meeting together as well. And so we have these smaller groups all throughout the church where we come together to encourage one another in the faith. Be be aware of those opportunities that are available. With that, let's gather our hearts together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We will then sing his praise and then dig into God's word. Will you pray with me? Now, Father, we come together with our hearts joined in faith. And Father, we come before you in the knowledge that you love us, that your spirit moves among us, that he speaks into our hearts. We come together rejoicing in the fact that the blood of the lamb redeems us and that in Christ we are presented faultless before your holy presence with great joy. We thank you, Father. We thank you for all that we have in Christ. And Father, we confess that we are a people of unclean lips and we dwell among a people of unclean lips. And Father, we pray for your healing, the healing grace. We pray that it would be released upon the impurities of this land, and that it would begin with your people. We pray that you would heal the frailties and the weaknesses and the impurities that even dwell within the church. Father, we come before you, and we pray that you would help us to see our sins. We pray that you would help us to walk in your ways by the power of your spirit. We pray that you would help us to be those who are witnesses of the good news that is in Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that your grace would be shed all abroad in this land. 
And Father, we pray that people would see the glory of your ways in these United States. We pray that you would heal the impurities of this nation. Lord, we pray that people, by your, the working of your common grace, would be able to see your design. Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability to see how you have designed marriage And Father, I pray that there would be a clear understanding of the gift of marital intimacy. How it is blessed within marriage and how it becomes dangerous outside of marriage. And I pray that there would be this understanding. Father, we pray that there would be an end to the practice of abortion. Lord, we pray that there would be healing of sexual immorality, which leads to so much pain and heartache. Father, we also pray that there would be harmony among the peoples that are here in these United States. We pray that there would be healing of the acrimony. But Father, within each one of us, there is sin that we desire the things that are bad for us, that are damaging that are sinful, and we respond to other people in ways that are not good. So Lord, even as we ask that more and more people will see the goodness of your ways, they would understand that within themselves they are not good and they need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. We pray that you would be at work in this country through your church. Now, Father, we come before you with the burdens and the wounds and the scars that occur as we walk in this fallen world. We pray that you would also lift our hearts up in the joy of our salvation. I pray that these songs would lift the spirit as we worship you. And Father, we pray that you would give us eyes to see what's in your word. We pray that your spirit would help us to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And as we dig into Job and some heavy content released from a man who was suffering, we pray that our hearts would understand and we pray that our eyes would be seen, that our eyes would see the mercy that comes in Christ Jesus our Lord. We call upon your name in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest on you all. Today's reading from the scripture will be the first six verses of Psalm 130. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. The word of the Lord.
Amen, and praise God for the healing grace that he has for our hearts in the midst of the hard things that we face in this life, and thank you, Lord, also for your gifts of grace. Our God is good, and we're going to study about our Lord once again in the book of Job, and the book of Job helps us through the hard times that we face in this world. Now, the title of this morning's message is The Wonder in the Subpoena, and if you think that that's something of a strange title for a sermon, I would have to agree with you, but at the same time, this is, I I think, a good summary of what we find in this portion of Scripture before us today. Now, a subpoena is a call to appear in court. It's a summons. And it may come to pass that someday you get a subpoena and you have to appear in court and it may be that you have to appear because somebody is suing you. And that's what's on Job's mind here in this portion of this book. He wants to bring a lawsuit against the Lord. That's what we see coming up from his heart as he expresses it here in what he says. Now, as we continue here in the drama of this epic story, let us understand that we have an angry man here before us. We have a man who is filled with bitterness. He is revealed to us in the opening chapters of the book as a very godly man, even a blameless man, a man who was walking with the Lord seeking by grace to truly walk in God's ways. And he was doing this to such a degree that the Lord said he is blameless, he is upright. He's a man who fears the Lord and turns away from evil. And yet he is a godly man that has suffered profound loss in his life. We've seen, we saw early in the book of Job, the destruction of his livelihood, how his wealth was stripped away. We saw the deaths of his 10 precious children. And then we saw that his health also was struck so that he had these boils, these loathsome sores that were covering his body. And those were just part of the symptoms he was experiencing. He had fevers. He had all of these things that were taking place. And here in this book, we find that it just hit him like a whirlwind out of nowhere. And as the book unfolds, we see, using the language that we saw in the book last week, that he was vexed. Within him, there was this blend of anger and anguish and anxiety and frustration. And in that condition, it is now his desire. He's expressing this desire to... Take God to court so that the Lord would have to account for what happened in his life. Meanwhile, his three friends are there with him, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. They are there. They had a, they had a time of deep ministry with him initially where, when they just sat there in silence with him on the ground for seven days But the point in time came when Job started speaking and they started speaking too and they went from comforting to counseling to confronting. And, you know, as much as I'd like to say that they were just like a bunch of pesky flies buzzing around his head, flies don't have the ability to plunge daggers into people's hearts. And that's what these friends were doing to Job with their insufficient theology which was a strange mix of retribution theology and I think even prosperity theology. And they they were just trying to direct him and they were calling him to repentance, but the Lord said that he was a blameless man. He was not to be blamed for what happened there in his life. And so while the three friends are there and we will get back to them in the weeks ahead because it's very important that we deal with what they were trying to counsel him with. For now, this morning, I want for our attention to be focused in on this this portion in chapter 9 of Job's ongoing lament. This portion has really gripped my heart this week. 
as I pray it will grip yours as well. And in this portion that is ahead of us this morning, we see Job continuing just to process all that has happened in his life, and we see how it is affecting his view of God. We see it very clearly. And then we also see, as we go into the second portion of what we're going to get into today, is that he was also just seeking a way forward, seeking a way out, considering different strategies. And so we'll take it this morning in two parts. First, we will see how Job considers a summons for God to appear in some kind of court. And then second, we will see how Job seeks a way forward in his life. As we do, I pray that the Lord will speak into our lives because the fact of the matter is that we too walk through times of suffering and the anguish that we experience may color and influence and even taint our view of God. And so it helps us to see how another man of God dealt with that too. Then what we'll see as we get into the latter portion of what's here, that Job, it's like his fingertips were brushing against a key that would unlock so much peace and grace for him. And he's almost there. And we living in this day, in these last days, in these end times where we have the fullness of Scripture, it's a key that we can grab onto in the times of our suffering. So we will dig in. Let's see what is here. First, we will see how Job considers a summons for God. And as we read through what's here, it will not take long for us to see how his heart was now being filled with bitterness to the God he worshipped. And so we see, starting in verse 16 of chapter 9, If I summoned him and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not let me get my breath but fills me with bitterness. If it is a contest of strength, behold, he is mighty. If it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am in the right, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I am blameless, he would prove me perverse. I am blameless. I regard not myself. I loathe my life. It is all one, therefore, I say. He destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked, and he covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? And so we see that Job is bitter toward the Lord. It's very, very clear. And here in chapter 9, we see that Job is dealing with this age-old question that believers and philosophers and theologians have been wrestling with all throughout history. It's this question that is often called by some the theodicy. And this theodicy boils down to the problem of evil and suffering in God's world. And the question of it is something like this. If there is a God, and if He truly is good and benevolent, and if he is also omnipotent, almighty, and sovereign over the affairs of this earth, then how is it that there is so much evil and suffering in the world that he is governing? And how is it that this evil and this suffering even touches and breaks down the lives of those who are redeemed and who belong to him? We can understand if God punishes just the wicked, but those to him, those who confess their sin and come to him for forgiveness, they suffer profoundly too. How is this possible if God is all-powerful, if he is truly kind, and he's in control? How is it that this is the case? That is the question of 
theodicy, which means a defense of the justice of God. It's a question raised by theologians all through the ages. And really, there are just a handful of ways that that question can be answered. I will mention four of them to you. One way that people have answered this question of suffering in God's world is to say, it's just evidence that there is no God. The reason why there's all this pain, the reason why there, there's all this anguish, and it is even there among the people of God, it just shows that God is not there. We are left to fend against evil people ourselves, and we are just subject to the blind forces of nature, and that's it. There are some people who see all the suffering and say there is no God. There's a second way that people respond to this question. The second way is that they say that God is good, that his heart is truly kind, that God is, in fact, love, but he is limited in his power. And he is not sovereign over everything that occurs in this world. For if he were all-powerful and he was totally sovereign, he would not allow the suffering that he does out of the kindness of his heart. That's how some people answer this, but looking at what Job has written, Job was not one who would answer it in this way. You look at what is here in these chapters of Job, and really throughout the book, what we find is that he knows God exists. He sees this wonderful world that has been created. He sees the, the majesty and the creativity that's displayed all throughout this universe. And he knows that there is a designer, that there is a God, and he knows that God is almighty. He says, don't tell me that God does not exist and I am just suffering because, don't tell me that I'm just suffering because God can't do anything about what's happening because he's not able. You look at what he writes and what he, what he expresses as recorded in the writing. You see that he knows that there is an almighty sovereign God. There's no question about it in his heart. Look at how he says it. Look at, what, look at the things that come from him earlier in the chapter. Chapter 9, verse 4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? He who removes mountains and they know it not. When he overturns them in his anger. Who shakes, he who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. He who commands the sun and it does not rise. Who seals up the stars. Who alone stretched out the heavens and, tramples, and trampled the waves of the sea. He who made the bear and the Orion, the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. He is responsible for all of these mighty constellations above. He who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number. Job knows that there is a God and that he is almighty. And he knows that he's sovereign over the affairs of man. Look at and turn the page, chapter 12. Look at some of the things that Job says, beginning in verse 16. He says, with God, with him, there is strength and sound wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away stripped, and he judges, and judges he makes fools. He looses the bonds of kings and binds a waistcloth on their hips. He leads priests away stripped and overthrows the mighty. He deprives the speech of those who are trusted. He takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on princes and looses the belts of the strong. He uncovers the deep the deeps out of darkness and brings deep darkness to light. He makes nations great. He destroys them. He enlarges nations. He leads them away. He takes away the understanding from the chiefs of the earth, of the peoples of the earth, and makes them wander in pathless ways. They grope in the dark without light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. Job is a man who understands that God is almighty and that he is sovereign over the affairs of the human race. He, if, he so, if he so desires, God can stop the sun. 
And God could do as he deems fit with even the greatest rulers of the earth. So Job is saying, don't tell me that what's happened in my life is Satan's fault and God couldn't do anything about it. He's saying, don't tell me that the one who shakes the pillars and the foundations of the earth could not have stopped a whirlwind. Don't tell me that the one who intervenes in the hearts of princes and kings could not have altered the will of the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans that destroyed my livelihood. Don't tell me that God is some grandpa in the sky who just says, I'd help you if I could. I would if I could, but my hands are tied. We're not talking about a friendly, grandfatherly figure in the sky. We're talking about the almighty, sovereign, living God, the only being in existence whose power is literally limitless. These are the things that come from Job's heart. He knows that God is, there is a God who is sovereign and almighty. So he's not going to have this second answer that God is benevolent but he's not all powerful in this world that he has created but this leads Job his heart answers this question here in his frustration and in his sorrow and in his pain he starts leaning into the third way that people answer this question there are some who say, and we see it here in Job, that there is a God who is almighty, who is sovereign, who's in control, but he is not all good. His heart is not filled with kindness. He is not perfect in love. There are some who view God that way, and that's where Job, even this brother in the Lord, even this man of God, in the midst of what he was going through, that's where his heart was taking him. We see it. It's very clearly laid out for us in the pages of Scripture inspired for our good by the Holy Spirit. Do you see what Job said? Chapter 9, verse 22. He says, It is all one, therefore I say, God destroys both the blameless and the wicked. It's all one. It's all the same. You can have a person who is seeking a blameless walk before the Lord, seeking to do the will of the Lord, or you can have a person who is walking in flat-out iniquity, just despising the law of the Lord. It does not matter. It's all one. He will destroy them both. That's what Job says right there for us. And then in 23, when disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. He mocks it. What a charge to bring before the Lord, the living God. And he says in verse 24, it's this way all throughout the planet Earth. It's all given into the hand of the wicked. And so we see Job, he's, he's entertaining some dim thoughts about the Lord. And we've got to understand here, brothers and sisters, that in the midst of his anguish and in the midst of his pain, Job is saying things about God that are not true. These are not true statements. This is not how the Lord is. The prophet Ezekiel, carried by the Spirit, tells us that the Lord doesn't even delight in the destruction of the wicked. That's not who God is. God's heart is perfect in goodness and in righteousness and in love. He is. What we see here, brothers and sisters, is that while Job was a man who was in the Lord, walking with the Lord, when the pressure was applied, there were things that stirred inside of him that were impure before the Lord and about the Lord. And what we are reminded of is that there is only one in human history that was perfect in his knowledge, that was perfect in his inward purity, who was perfect in his speech, who was truly, totally submitted to the plan of God even in suffering, and that is Christ. Christ alone who suffered 
in a way that was even more profound than Job never said anything untrue about God. It never released from him because it just wasn't in him. Christ alone is the hero of Scripture. Christ alone is the Savior. But brothers and sisters, there's a, first, there's a fourth way that people deal with this question of theodicy. There's a fourth answer to this question. And the fourth answer is a very important one. It's this. It's that there is a God. He exists. This universe, with all of its design, did not pop into existence uncaused from nothing way back in some beginning. It was created by God in the beginning. There is a God. He is perfect in his character and in his righteousness and in his love. He is almighty. He is sovereign and he is wise beyond measure, wise beyond searching out. And he has reasons for the hardship and the suffering that we face in this life we don't fully perceive them in this life but they do in fact issue forth in glory that is everlasting god has a much bigger picture than what happens in this world and he has wisdom that is unsearchable this is what it says in romans chapter 11 this this fourth view is the biblical perspective on this question Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor and who has given a gift to him that he should be repaid for from him and through him And to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul, who knew his taste of suffering in this life, said that God has wisdom that is unsearchable. And from him all things come. And it's through that lens that we can really appreciate these words from Scripture. Here in Romans chapter 8, Paul is also talking about the groanings that we face as followers of Christ in this world. Life can be so hard sometimes that we emit groans. But in the midst of all the things that cause those groans, Paul says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good who have been called according to his purpose. God, the all things work for the good of those who are called according to the purpose of God because God is working them toward good. He is working them for good. And what is the purpose we've been called to? Christ-likeness. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So in all things, God is working in ways that would blow our minds if we can see the grand picture that he sees. Sometimes we see it in this life, but much of the time we're going to have to wait until glory comes. So this fourth answer, that God is and that he is all-powerful, that his heart is righteous and kind, and that he is wise beyond measure, that's also the answer of the book of Job. There were things going on in Job behind the things behind the theme behind the scenes with Job that Job had no idea about. He doesn't know what we know. He doesn't know the spiritual warfare that he was at the center of. He didn't know that. God had this profound blessing awaiting him at the end of his life that was just an emblem of what was going to be poured down on Job's head in the eternal kingdom to come. Job did not know how there would be literally billions of people who would read his story and be strengthened by it. God was at work in ways that Job did not know and often in the suffering we face, God is at work in ways we don't know, but he is at work 
and his heart is good. And this is the testimony of Scripture. And so we continue on. We have our brother Job. He's still sour. He's still there and he's in all this internal vexation. He's in a wretched condition. But what we see is that there's also this longing within him. There's a homing instinct. It keeps bringing him back to his God. And so with all of this, we move forward in this text and we see that Job is searching for a way forward. He knows he's at the end of his, in his well, at least from his perspective, he just feels that he has just a little bit of life left. His days are fleeting, and he's just thinking about how can I make the most of the time that is just slipping away. And so we see Job seeking a way forward. Chapter 9, verse 25 Job says, my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. They go by like skiffs of reed, those little boats that go over the marshes. They go by like an eagle swooping on its prey. Now, if I say, I will forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face, and I will be of good cheer, I will become afraid of all of my suffering. For I know that you will not hold me innocent. I shall be condemned. Why then do I labor in vain? If I wash myself with snow and I cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into a deep pit and my clothes will, uh, my clothes will abhor me. For he is not a man as I am that I may answer him, that we should come to trial together. There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him. For I am not so, I am just not right within myself. So you see how in these verses Job is just looking for the way forward, looking for the way back to harmony with his God. You see him searching, and here in what we just read, we can discern three possible strategies that he's weighing up, that he's considering. First strategy that we see there is the way of positive thinking. Did you notice that there? You know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna think happy thoughts. (laughs) See him weighing that up in verse 27? I'll forget my complaint. I'll put off my sad face and I'll be of good cheer. That's the spirit. Job's like, I will just turn my frown upside down. Turn the frown upside down so my face is smiling again. I'll fake it till I make it. I'll just conjure up this joy within me. He's thinking about that. He's contemplating that. But there's an if at the beginning of that. He says, if I say this... I'll just become afraid of my suffering. He's just waiting for the next wave to enter his life. He's scared like a person after waiting the aftershocks after a massive earthquake. And he says, I know you won't hold me innocent. He's like, I have all of this bitterness and resentment toward God inside of me. It's not right and I can't just put on a smiley face over it and just think that I could be held innocent when I have these irreverent thoughts in me that dance on the border of blasphemy. That's what I think that that means. (laughs) He's like, I can't just whitewash over this. We human beings, many of us, we are perfectly willing to whitewash over toxic things. Just picture with me an old rickety wooden fence with these different sections of total dry rot. There are some who are just like, let's just plaster over that rot. Forget about the structure of the fence. We'll just plaster over that dry rot. We'll paint the whole fence, and presto, it's as good as new. We often do that in human relationships. Things are bad. Things are filled with resentment, and there's friction, and there's frustration. Eh, Let's just put on a happy face and act like it's not there. 
Job is considering that, and he's like, that just does not work with my God. God's not going to have that. I know I can't have that. And it's just a reminder for us that if through the hardships of this life, if we become bitter toward, we become embittered toward the Lord, we've got to deal with it. We, what, following Job's example, following the example of the songs of lament in the Psalms and in the prophets, we need to pour our hearts out to the Lord. Casting our anxieties upon the Lord is not this polite, gentle little thing. It heaves. That's what we have Job doing here. We've got to release and confess to the Lord what is in us. We continue on here and we see that Job realizes, okay, the, this, the power of positive thinking is not going to be so potent with my situation. Sorry, Robert Schuler, Ain't going to work here. So we continue on and we see a second way that he was considering. The way of self-improvement. Way of self-cleansing so that he can go before the Lord and get this hashed out. He says, In verse 30, if I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into a pit and my own clothes will abhor me. So Job here is saying, okay, I've got to get things figured out with God, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clean myself up. I'm going to find the purest form of condensation, pure, fresh, white snow. I'll get some of that. I'll get the strongest detergent on the market. I'll get this lye. I will scrub myself, and I will put on my clothes to go and appear before the Lord and get this thing sorted out. And Job in just the blurred vision of God that he's dealing with says, if I tried that, God would just take me and just toss me down into some pit that he thinks that I belong in. That's what he says there. Now, even as we read this, and even as we know and we perceive that these things are coming out of a very dark place in Job's heart, (laughs) there's something there that just resonates with those who are being saved by the grace of the living God. Because there comes this understanding that, yeah, it is true. I am tainted with sin. There there are spots deep within me that are unclean. There's this uncleanness that's pervasive really within me. And there's nothing I can do to cleanse myself in God's sight. I need somebody else to cleanse me. There's no detergent of human creation or even even no human philosophy or idea that can cleanse the heart before God. There's only one agent that can cleanse and it is the precious blood of the Messiah that our God has provided, that we might, in fact, be clean in his sight. Job says this way of self-improvement, it's not going to work, and now he goes into this third way of thinking about how to just go forward with the Lord, and this is the way of qualified mediation, and Job knew that this is what he really needed. He knew that he was in a wretched place and that he was in need of help. He knew that he could not have this standoff with Almighty God. God was on a different level altogether. He was not, God is not a man that any man can contend with God. Job knew that he needed a very unique go-between, somebody who can put a hand on both shoulders. But even that thought left him hopeless because he didn't know anybody capable of that. Verse 33, he says, There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on on us both. Let him take his rod away from me and let not dread of him terrify me. These verses that we read here, verse 33, verse 34, they, they carry this nuance of longing 
He's longing for such a mediator, for such an arbiter. In some translations, for such an umpire. He's longing for it. Someone who has the ability to take the rod of God away from him. And he's thinking, I don't know who that is. Who is there in this universe that has the power to approach Almighty God and put his hand on the shoulder of Almighty God, then at the same time, look upon me. If he has power to do that, how is he going to be able to put his hand on me without just leveling with me? Who is there who's capable of doing this? And brothers and sisters, at this point in time, we have got to step away from the ash heap in the land of us where Job was dealing with all of this way back in Old Testament times and we got to move ourselves into this day and age of new covenant blessing we live in this age where the fullness of God's redemptive grace is being revealed and of course brothers and sisters we remember that there is someone uniquely qualified there is someone who can be a mediator between God and man because there is one who is both God and man. And in this one person, there is perfect humanity and undiminished deity joined into one. As Paul states in Colossians 2 verse 9, in Christ, in Christ the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So that he can also say in 2 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Jesus can do that. Now here, here's the thing about it though. Job said that he wanted an arbiter. Job said that he wanted an umpire. He wanted somebody who would be an impartial party to stand in the middle and mediate this issue from a neutral perspective but that's not who Jesus is to his people yes he is an intercessor but he's so much more than a go-between Jesus is revealed to us in the pages of the New Testament as one who is an advocate and an advocate is just not this impartial in-between type of person an advocate crosses over and he comes into the corner, puts his arm around the one that he advocates and supports. And that's what we have in Christ. In seeing us in the midst of our sin in our, and our suffering, we have one who longs to have all of our sin washed clean and to have us brought back into perfect harmony with the living God. Jesus is the advocate of all of those who come to him in faith, drawn in by the grace of the living God. He's our advocate. 1 John, we, now we come to Christ, we must come to Christ confessing that we are sinners. If anybody says we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Anybody says, you know what, I'm not that bad. I, you know what? There's no reason why God, I should come under the judgment of a holy God. They don't understand themselves. John is saying, if you say you don't have sin, you're deceiving yourself. And the truth is not in you. That applies to anybody on this earth who would say that they are not fallen in sin. But he's speaking to the church. Look at what he says going into chapter 2. Verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children. My children, the people in the church, I am saying these things. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So we see that Jesus is our Savior He's our advocate, and he is the one who longs that we be right with God. Now, he is speaking to the church in this, and this shows that Christians, people who have been born again, who have been united to God through faith in Christ, they have the ability to continue to practice sin. It happens. The residue of sinful nature remains in us, and Christians 
stumble in sin. Sometimes they rebel in sin. Christians are capable of sin. Sometimes it can come that we come to pass that we are in the midst of painful times where the sufferings of this earth press down upon us and like dross rising up from the refiner's fire, certain impurities can come forth from within us where we start just raging against the God who provides us with eternal redemption in Christ. Sometimes Christians get angry at God. And I know myself well enough, and I know the people of the church well enough. That's true among us in the Bethel Grace family. Sometimes we get mad at God and will say things that are just impure. And in the midst of those things, Jesus is not one who's repelled. Oh, you really blew at that time. I don't know if I can help you with that. No, Jesus is our advocate. He's drawn to us all the more. He loves us, and he wants to come, be, come bring us back into this peace and harmony that he has achieved for us. He wants us to go back into the experience of it. And even when we sin, it could be that we sin and these impurities are released from us in the midst of suffering, or it can be that we're just being flat out foolish. In the midst of these times, Jesus is the one who is our defense before the Lord. And Jesus is the one who speaks in our defense, and he pleads his wounds for us. He pleads his death on the cross for us. And this is the good news of the advocate that we have as revealed to us here in the New Testament in 1 John. So that when you are in Christ, you don't have to clean your own garments. Jesus cleanses you by his blood and he clothes you in his righteousness as a gift. And when you are in Christ, you don't have to make your own case before God Jesus makes the case for you. Jesus is the Savior. And in the midst of the painful things that we have in life, in the midst of seasons and days and instances where our impurities are being revealed, we just need to cast ourselves upon the grace of our Savior who loves us. And this is something that Job was just kind of breath. <laughs> if only there was a mediator, his fingertips, oh, he, he barely, he, he's not quite there in what we read. Now here in the New Testament days, it's just a key that's placed in our hands. That, that, that it just be this understanding of just the unbelievable grace of God. God that continues drawing us back in even when we're suffering and we're spouting things out in sin. But I'm going to finish with this. <laughs> there is this moment in the book of Job moving forward. Yeah, we, we were there on the ash heap in Job in the land of Uz. We came back to our time of New Testament fullness. Now we go back. And I just want to close by showing you this amazing messianic prophecy, this vision of glory that Job had in the midst of his suffering. It's an amazing picture that we see over in chapter 16. Look at this glimpse of glory, how, the, how this idea of a mediator, it, it, it took traction in his heart, and God was making something known to him, restoring hope within him, Job says in 16, 18, O earth, cover not my blood and let my cry find no resting place. He's not ready to die yet. He, he just, he wants to continue on in this world serving the Lord. He says, even now, even now, behold, behold, my witness is in heaven and he who testifies for me is on high. My friends scorn me, and my eye pours out tears to God that he would argue the case of a man with God, as a son of man does with his neighbor. For when a few years have come, I shall go the way 
from which I shall not return. But do you, you see what's going on there? He has this, this knowledge, this hope rising up in his heart. I do have a witness in heaven. Behold, there is one who is testifying for me. It's amazing what we read at the end of 20 into 21. My eyes are pouring out tears to God that he would argue the case of a man with God. He's crying to God so that God, God will have his case before God. What's that all about? It's wonderful. That's another one of these moments in the, uh, the New Testament that helps us to know there's one God, but there's plurality within that one God. Just like in Genesis chapter 1, one God, God, one singular said, let us create man in our image, plural. And here we have God defending a man before God. And brothers and sisters, the Son of God, the Christ, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ was in existence. The Son of God has always existed, and He was there even in the time of Job. And it seems that Job just had this glimpse and it gave him a surge of hope so that I pray that when painful times fall upon our paths that what Job came to understand just with a glimpse I pray that it would shine so brilliantly in our hearts that we have an advocate that loves us even in the midst of the hard times that we face he died on the cross he's risen from the grave he's coming back and we will share in an eternal kingdom with him, a kingdom that we are receiving even now. Let's close in a word of prayer. And our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you that you know your people. I thank you that you know the depths of every heart. You know all that's being carried. You know the burdens of each one. You know the heaviness that we often carry in this life. And I thank you that in the midst of these things, your heart is one of unrelenting mercy to those who have entered into a relationship with you through Christ. Father, even when our hearts are foul, you remain faithful to us. We are your bride and you will never, in no ways, cast us off. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, and I pray that it would well up within us. Father, I pray for anybody who's listening, any, anybody in your church who's suffering. Lord, I pray that they would hear the echoes and the, not just the echoes, but the calls of your grace to come to Jesus and to abide and to rest in him. Lord, if there's any listening to this who has not come into a relationship with you through Christ, I pray that they would know that you are holy, that you are perfect, that you are pure in all of your ways, that you are righteous, and that your heart is good, and that your heart is kind, and that you have prepared a way for the hearts of sinful people to be cleansed, and that you cover us in righteousness as a gift, that Jesus is the Savior. Let their hearts turn to him in faith. And I pray that they would be born into a new life that they tell us about. Father, I pray that you would fill our hearts with worship, even in the midst of the painful times. Lord, you are at work doing great things. And help us to recognize them and to rejoice in them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being with us.